Hey viewers, this position should look familiar to you because I just posted a video from here talking about my prejudice research and a couple of books and also my impending trip to England. Impending makes it sound like I'm not looking forward to it, but I am. Anyway, in the last video I listed seven principles from this book by Joyce and River Higginbotham that they have found to be common amongst all pagans and I wanted to know if you guys agreed and I've gotten some comments so far, I haven't gone through all of them, but some of them have made me realize that listing them without telling you what the authors said about it has brought some confusion to some of you. So I'm going to give you a little more of their actual words and explanations for these seven principles and see if that clears things up. And then also, since I have to return this book to the library, this video will just be good for me to have for my records to remember what they said as well. Some of the comments I've gotten so far though is that most of you agree but said that your religion is nature-based. That is because I said that I liked that the principles do not include a portion about nature because I have recently learned that not all pagan paths are nature-based. However, mine is, a lot of yours evidently are, and this book is obviously expecting that a lot of them will be because it's called Paganism, an Introduction to Earth-Centered Religions. So while nature is not in the principles, it is expected that many of them are centered around that. A couple of you have said that you agree with all of the principles except consciousness surviving death, so that was an interesting thing. And a lot of you commented that you agree with the principles, but your deity chose you instead of you choosing deity, and that actually is not part of the principles, so I think I just failed to explain the third principle fully. So without further ado, here they are. Sorry, they're working outside, so it's going to be a bit noisy sometimes. The first principle is, you are responsible for the beliefs you choose to adopt. In their words, you are in control of what you choose to believe, especially when it comes to ideas about spirituality, ethics, values, the nature of the divine, the nature and purpose of the physical world, and your place in it. The power to choose your beliefs resides in you, not in an institution, church, or government. It's important that you take responsibility for the beliefs you choose to adopt because beliefs act as templates around which you build your reality. Skipping a little bit, it goes on, regardless of the beliefs impressed on you in the past, you are in control of what you choose to adopt as your beliefs now. Pagans accept their responsibility to become more self-aware, identify the beliefs they are allowing to operate in their lives, and then to examine the merits of those beliefs periodically. So the first principle is just about you consciously deciding what you want to believe and taking responsibility for that instead of saying, well, I believe this because someone else told me to. It's really more of you being aware and purposely believing what you do and knowing why you do and taking responsibility for it. The second principle, you are responsible for your own actions and your spiritual and personal development. I'm not going to read every word, but here's part. Any resource, teacher, practice, or holy writing that helps you move toward your goal of spiritual maturity can and should be used. Resources, teachers, and holy books cannot be substituted for the effort each person must give to his or her own growth, however, since growth is a muscle you must exercise yourself. Spiritual muscles don't get strong by letting other people do your work for you. Pagans strive to become spiritually mature and take responsibility for their beliefs, actions, and spiritual growth. Yeah, so that principle is basically just um, not expecting the fact that you label yourself a certain way to make you grow spiritually. You just, you really have to be self-motivated. Three, this is the one that got a little bit confused before, I think, because of the way I said it. You are responsible for deciding who or what deity is for you and forming a relationship with that deity. This principle does not say anything about you picking your specific working deity or them picking you. This is what it says. Someone who joins a particular faith has gone through the process of deciding what deity is for them, and that the faith they are joining is a good match. Pagans openly acknowledge this process and are open to a variety of ideas about deity. Pagans have many images of deity, including multiple images, male, female, animal, energy, or spirit images, or no images at all. So this principle is not about whether I choose to work with a specific deity or that deity chooses me. This principle is just about concept of deity, and you are responsible for deciding what you think the idea of of deity means to you. So you're responsible for deciding whether you think deity is literal, symbolic, archetypal, non-existent, whether it has a gender, whether it has a color, whether it has a feeling, stuff like that. So it's not talking about specific deities, it's only talking about the concept in general. So I'm sorry I didn't make that clear before. Number four is everything contains the spark of intelligence. From the smallest atom to the largest planetary system, each part of the world contains a form of consciousness or spark of intelligence. In the physical realm, consciousness exhibits as awareness, personality, energetic vibrations, or other characteristics that are in keeping with the particular physical form. Science and mysticism both suggest that consciousness is multidimensional, that it folds and unfolds into physical reality from unseen realms, and its expression in the physical world is only a part of its greater 
greater reality. So this explanation means that the spark of intelligence could be something like an energy vibration, and so it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be an animate object to have a spark of intelligence in it. It, ha it just is the idea that everything contains a spark and a connection to the divine, and that could be shown in many ways, including energy. Number five, everything is sacred. Sacredness means different things to different pagans. To some, it means all parts of the universe are precious and worthy of respect and careful handling. To others, it implies a feeling of kinship, a connection, a kind of cosmic brother or sisterhood. To others, sacredness means that something is holy, having been created, blessed, or approved by a deity. Then it goes on to say that to some, it also relates to how deity is involved with physical and non-physical universes, and whether by nature the universe is good or evil. Talking about how things are connected to deity and nothing is cut off from the divine ground and there's a whole paragraph on that. Number six, each part of the universe can communicate with each other part and these parts often cooperate for specific ends. Here is the crux of magic. Magic is a completely natural process which in its simplest form is the communication and cooperation of many consciousnesses. Other religions call this same process prayer, meditation, inspiration, synchronicity, or miracles. I know one person on the other video commented that they're not sure every pagan path has an idea or a concept of magic. So this, I think, speaks to that when it says that even other religions have this idea of the same thing, of different parts of consciousness working together and everything being connected, but they call it different things. Some pagans may not call it magic or work with magic or craft, spellcraft in general, but this principle is just talking about the idea of everything's energy being interconnected and being able to work with things based on associations and like attracts like and things like that. And number seven, consciousness survives death. They explain, Consciousness, as was earlier suggested, exists on multiple levels simultaneously, and physical reality is only one expression of it. Physical existence can be seen as the intrusion of consciousness into the world of matter, and death as the withdrawing or enfolding of it back into other dimensions. Pagans hold a variety of views of what happens after death, and most, though not all, believe in an afterlife. So they do add in here that this list is not a list of seven things that pagans must believe in order to be considered a pagan. This is just a list of things that they have encountered as being common to most pagans. Um, as it says, most pagans we know agree with most or all of these principles. So it makes sense that a lot of you were saying, I agree with all but one or all but two, or I think of it in a slightly different way. I just really wanted to know what you guys thought about it, and it does seem that at least for the most part, most of us agree. They also say the actual beliefs adopted Adopted by pagans on these issues are not as important as the underlying process of spiritual growth and personal development these principles represent. It is our opinion that spiritual maturity tends to express itself in similar ways at common stages of development, regardless of a person's culture or religion. So there you have it, the seven principles of paganism from Joyce and River Higginbotham, and a little bit more explanation, so I hope I clarified those ones that seemed to be a little uninclusive or confusing. Because I had read it, I didn't even think that they could be taken a different way. So thank you to those of you who commented and let me know that there are different ways to interpret it when you just see the principle and not the explanation. So I hope that helped you out and I will see you next time. Thank you very much for watching. Blessed be and goodbye.